I, I remember yes. so vividly doing a scene in The Patriot where Mel Gibson cradles dying Heath Ledger in his arms and sobs, sobs, keening. I mean, you know, he's a phenomenal actor, Mel, when he's, you know, doing the right thing at the right time. And he'll be mm. standing there smoking a cigarette, telling the filthiest stories. I mean, <laughs> jaw dropping, hair curling, completely inappropriate joke. And they go, we're ready, got to all that. And then he'd run in front of the cameras and the camera would come down and 10,000 dollars come over and he'd grab Heath and he would burst out and he would rip his soul out. They'd come out and go, so anyway, the doctor says to the guy, you know, and um, <laughs> it's not, and it isn't that he's pretending, but that's what the mistake about acting, it isn't that, so he, do, he goes off and does a funny voice or he does a, you know, he goes, oh, I'll be the butch guy who's uh, fighting the war. He's, he's able to tap deep into himself and be completely something, mm. completely acting completely heartbroken and completely a very blue nightclub comic you know <laughs> that's so fascinating um and actually I, I, i'm glad you brought up the patriot because I, I do want to touch on that because the i think it's the 20th anniversary of that film is coming up in in oh, june shit, which is, is it? yeah yeah wow. which is kind of crazy to think about um and actually that was i think that's oh. the first film that i saw you in which is weird because i was i was a kid at the time and the first film i right. saw you in was the patriot and not you harry must potter have been too young to see that who, who let you watch I, the patriot how old were you uh i think it was like five or six that is much too young to watch the patriot <laughs> people get their heads knocked off and i know blown away and stuff i know stabbed through the throat i wow. I, yeah. I, I still social services now yeah right <laughs> i still i mean i still like uh you know have flashbacks to that 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 scene when the <laughs> yeah, should... you know the two the two armies are marching to each other and the cannonball just rips the guy's head off like yeah, yeah. oh my god yeah. that's i mean it's brutal brutal stuff but yeah. um i i do kind of want to just kind of like touch on uh your experience making that movie tapping into such i i mean such just like a wretched character um and uh you know how, how i mean i mean he's like he's he's genuinely one of the 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 most like hated villains at least i can think of yeah. like of all time he's, well i mean i think partly worst. that's because it's on tv somewhere in america every 25 seconds oh yeah so well that's most true. Hated yeah. because people have just had so much experience from doing that stuff uh mm. it being a film about the uh, war of independence uh, a lot of people so when i've gone to conventions a lot of people come up on pictures of colonel tamington and they go and they go, you know, my fifth grade history teacher showed us the movie, uh, you know, shows us in the summer. And all the time, I've got people come up and I go, and then they go, then what? And I go, and and then did he explain that nothing really happened like that? That's all bullshit. And he goes, no. What do you mean? Like, you know, it's, it's, there's almost nothing historically accurate about the Patriot. It's a fabulous oh, yeah. movie. I think Roland's a great yeah. storyteller. But there was a guy from the Smithsonian on the set. And, uh, <laughs> and everybody made fun of me all the time because, I knew nothing about the American Revolutionary War because it's not taught in British schools. Uh, not, I don't think, because it's a particularly embarrassing episode because, you know, the British history is littered with colonies we lost uh, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. wars that we lost. I think mm -hmm. it's just because there's much more history in Britain, so just we didn't cover it. I, I did 1939 to 1970, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, I didn't know anything about it at all. So I'd say to the guy from the Smithsonian, I'd go, hey, did, did the, so this... Is that how this works? Do they do this? Is this how they fought? And he'd go, oh, no, no. I go, oh, all right. <laughs> and then there'd be some other day, and i go, is that, did they come in with the flags for the side? No. And i go, is that when they went to people's houses and they recruited me? No. And I wonder, I said to him, so what the fuck are you doing here? He goes, oh, I think they just want to say, we had a guy from the Smithsonian on the set. <laughs> and I went, oh, all right, fair enough. Oh, my um, gosh. That's, uh, that's it was a brilliant. Hilarious. It was a brilliant. I mean, yeah. first of all, Everybody would have had a Scottish or Irish or Dutch accent. There weren't Americans right, right. and British yeah. people. It was neighbors fighting neighbors, obviously. But there are a million other things that are yeah. inaccurate. But then there are a million things, you know, that were, were accurate. I had um, my troop, the, the, the uh, you know, the dragoons were all reenactors who had given up their full time jobs, whatever they were, and they did a whole, whole variety, you know, doctors and lawyers and construction work and everything else. And they mm -hmm. just, you know, shuttered up their officers to come and live in camp i mean they were giving money in hotels but they wouldn't they lived in camp and they lived fully in the 18th century and yeah. made they couldn't make their costumes because they weren't allowed to they wanted to but they were shoeing their horses and you know polishing their guns and all this stuff and then i'd see them out sometimes at like outback steakhouse and they'd line up and salute me you know colonel and i'd go guys we're in outback steakhouse <laughs> Come on, get over it. I'm Jason here. And they go, come on. And then on the last day, they'd mold, they'd made me in their, their forge, they'd made me a pewter mug 
with the, the Green Dragoons. Wow. On. And they lined up at the go. I got out of bed at dawn and they lined up in the horses because they don't have their own horses. Uh, and they lined up and I, you know, I kind of did a little corridor and they saluted me and again. This thing was incredibly moving. Wow. It was beautiful. But yeah, yeah. The, the film was um the film was interesting because uh, you know, it was a German telling a story with an Australian English guy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that has become yeah. part of American folklore. The film is so popular. Mm-hmm. And, and has gained popularity over the years. And the music, the brilliant John Williams music, oh, has yeah, played, yeah. Uh, played at the Olympics and, and other places. Um, and it just has these iconic moments, and it just teaches you how much of history is taught us by the movies, and people who don't otherwise study the real history mm-hmm. end up thinking that's what happened. So the story of Vietnam was told by the, Viet- by the uh, Vietnam War movies, many of which are completely inaccurate. You know, the deer hunter, mm-hmm. none of, nothing like that ever happened. Right, but right. you'd be hard pressed to find, you know, everyone who knew that. And uh, this is the official story of the American Revolution, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm lucky to be in it. But you say that he was a, you know, a monster and a terribly evil guy. So that's what you said originally. Um, he's loosely based on a real guy called Tarleton, who was oh, seven okay. times MP, seven times member of parliament for where I come from, from Liverpool, oddly. And he's got a big, you know, he's got paintings uh, in the local gallery and everything. And um, yeah. What I, I did a bit of research beforehand, and uh, one of the things I got, Roland was kind enough to allow me to bring to the story, and they, they end up writing some things in as a backstory, is that lots of the officers who went over were the second sons of aristocrats. So they'd grown up in these giant estates with loads of money, but they weren't going to get anything. They weren't going to inherit anything at all. They were going to go back to poverty and penury because their elder brothers were never kind or generous. Uh, and so only if they won territory in the, the, this is the soldiers who came from England. Not, not, mm-hmm. Most of the people fighting were fighting their neighbours, but the ones who came over from England, they were fighting for their future. So they'd carry a map, and if they conquered somewhere, they'd mark it down. They go, oh, "That will be my land. I'll have that land." So uh, there was that, and then there was this other thing that, that became apparent to me. And I've played lots of soldiers beforehand and since, and, and been lucky enough to know lots of soldiers. But you can't mm-hmm. really, not really, you can't kill people if you're thinking them as human. You can't kill them if you're thinking them as fathers and brothers and sons and mothers and daughters you know in order to kill people mm. you have to switch that off you won't do a very good job and you won't do a very good job in war if you're trying to minimize casualties and ju- you know it's like how the, that john wayne notion of having a fight just till you, the guy goes down with a good right hook and then you stand up and shake hands and have a beer that's not the way the fights i see go down that's not the way war goes down so yes he's a monster and he's cruel and he's kind of enjoying it and like most bullies he's a coward um mm. But he wants to win, and we send people abroad in our names to win conflicts, and we don't want to know too much about what they do when they get there, because there's mm-hmm. only really one way to win most of these things. Uh, so yeah, I had, you know, it was finger licking good. He was scenery chewing. Oh yeah, uh, awful yeah. person. But yeah. I believed him. I believed. We came up with a backstory that we didn't make him a second son. We made him a son whose father had gambled away the entire family fortune. That made him very bitter. So there was oh, a reason wow. for him to be bitter. Um, yeah, and the other thing that was interesting while we're making it is that Mel had directed Braveheart, obviously, and he yeah. was constantly uh, trying to encourage me to direct, not that film, but you know, you should you should direct your own thing. It's great; all actors should. You're smart, and you know, you'd like it. Um, and so, when the stunt guys came to us very early on and said, "Can we show you the fight that you guys can start rehearsing that will end the movie?" Because you, know, you need to rehearse it for months; it's a complicated fight. They showed us this fight in which uh, they go, I- "I'll be you, Jason, and you know, Tony will be Mel." And they have a fight, and, and I would, you know, nick him on the arm, and then he'd headbutt me, and then I'd just miss him on the leg, and then he'd stab me in the chest, and then I'd, you know, he'd duck under a thing, and then he'd chop my arm off. And we did this fight, and, and Mel goes, Go on, you do it. And I go, Oh, because you tell them what's wrong with it. And I said, No, don't, don't you do it. But I'm nobody. You're a big giant movie star. He said, No, neither. You get used to it. So I said, Well, guys, so here's the thing I have to win the fight. And they went, What? I said, Well, I have to be as close to winning the fight as it's possible to get so the audience thinks Mel's going to lose. That's the only way the fight is interesting. And then right at the end, he's going to do something spurred by the memory of his dead son, uh, an yeah. echo of the kind of playing possum thing. But right up to that point, I'm a better fighter than him. I'm a colonel in the British Army, and I'm a better swordsman than him, and I'm a better fighter than him, and i got to cut him to ribbons. And I'm like, huh. Hmm. But, and I go, yeah, I know, I know, he's Mel Gibson. I get it. The audience wants to see Mel Gibson win. He will win but we're going to make them think he's going to lose. So they went away, and a month later, they came back with a whole new fight. They showed it to us, and they went, so you're going to stab me on the arm, and then you headbutt him, and then he cuts you through the hamstrings, and he gets you in the neck, and he gets you in the throat, and the chest, and then he cuts your ear off, and goes, all right. And I went, mm. no, well, you're, not, you're not getting it. 
I win the fight, the whole fight. Uh, and it took some time and hit and Mel jumping in going, guys, everybody knows I'm going to win. So that's why we have to make it look like I'm going to lose. But it was, he's a great storyteller. He wasn't directing. Yeah. You know, he was very happy to defer to Roland. He's a brilliant yeah. director. But when it came to details, he was like, he, he just understands story and how to fuck with an audience and, and manipulate their expectations really well. Yeah. Well, that's uh, interesting you mentioned that because out of Roland's entire filmography, that's the one film to me that sticks out as not. I mean, it's got staples of a Roland Emmerich film, but it doesn't feel like a Roland Emmerich film. Sure. Which is out, it's why I'm always surprised that Mel Gibson didn't direct it. It feels more like a Mel Gibson movie, you know? No, but Roland's a really talented director. He's chosen to work in a lot of the same genres because he loves that building those, uh, you know, he loves building worlds, building yeah. universes. Uh, he's not, a, you know, he's not, he's, I don't think he's ever going to do two cops chasing down a you know a drug dealer kind of thing it's just sure. you, you can build a universe got the capacity yeah. to it. i thought white house town is a brilliant film brilliant mm. it was unfortunate that it came out near the jerry butler film which was a similar uh, yeah yeah, I thought, yeah. Uh, but i thought it was great when he did something kind of still not normal size it's still a giant thing but uh there's not many people that can build a universe i uh, i saw midway very recently and mm. liked it a lot as mm. well. but no he was a he's an interesting guy you know that whole thing i was saying earlier about tell me what someone's like people often ask me what mel gibson's like Oh, yeah. uh, you can't sum up Mel Gibson in a sentence. He's all those things. He's all the things yeah. you think you've read about. And he's yeah. a million things more as well. And he's funny and self-deprecating. And he's also a giant star and director. And, and, and uh, similarly with Roland, to go, oh, he's the sci-fi guy. He's one of the best read people I've ever met. You know, he devours nonfiction books, you know, mm. one a day. Uh, when he did The Day After Tomorrow, mm. uh, his house was full because we used to be very friendly. I used to go and stay with him for our kids and the family. Uh, I would stay with him when I went to Hollywood. His, his house was full of books on the coming global superstorm and climate change and everything else. And he knew the science of it. And mm. then in the movie, he made this wave come in in a day. And the real scientists went, well, that's just ridiculous. That's just not going to happen like that. But he also knows how to tell a movie yeah. and um, how to tell a story in a way that works. And when I read the script, before he made it, I think, I can't remember, uh, I said, wait, the story is that Dennis Quaid says to Jake Gyllenhaal, you just wait, stay alive, and I'll come and find you? That's the story? He goes, yeah. And I, I go, what the fuck's he going to do when he gets there? Reverse this giant thing? Or he's just going to stay. I'm going to get it. Don't worry, son. I'll take care of this uh, global storm. It's not the point. It's a quest. And then I saw the movie, and he was absolutely right. It works as a quest. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. Because he had reinvented it for a, a kind of global palette, climate change then got on the syllabus at lots of schools. And Gorbachev used it as part of his green initiative. He used the movie and Roland and his contacts. And it mm. changed the way it was taught, and and uh, and it was used in various different, uh, uh, you know, capacities to teach. Yeah. So, uh, Roland's not what people think he is. Is my point. He's uh, he's yeah, capable yeah. Of, of directing anything. He just chooses to do those giant, uh, world-building movies because there's very few people that can, and he loves it. If yeah. You don't love yeah. it. There's a point in doing it. You watch yeah. movies. You know, there's a common. Uh, received wisdom but the most important thing and right is the human beings at the heart of it and, and Scorsese for instance famously doesn't give a fuck about bloopers there are blooper reels all over the internet and here in Thelma Schoonmaker is, is a editor they're like we don't care we don't care about you know whether a boom comes in or someone's smoking a cigarette and you cut back and it's a glass of beer instead we cut for performance <laughs> and you know yeah. uh, and that's true you know what's taxi driver boom comes in he gets in the car he's got the haircut gets out of the car he doesn't have the haircut it doesn't matter but it's also true that when you're getting a story right, if you've also sneaked under the radar, the audience isn't paying attention to, but they are enormously affected by the aesthetic of things. And Roland has an extraordinary eye. Just like, you know, uh, um, I did Black Hawk Down with Ridley. Ridley is an artist. Yeah. Ridley, Ridley would draw every frame. And if you compare, then there are exhibitions that I've seen. Uh, there's an exhibition at South Bank uh, of his alien stuff that, that the final frames of the movies look exactly like the very first drawings that he did and if you ask him mm. the question on set he's got a sketch pad he will sketch you an answer that mm. most people would give with words um, and, and yes it's true that the characters and the story and their, their dilemma is the most important thing but when there's an amazing aesthetic it can't help but seep through your consciousness and, and affect mm. you in other ways than, than the bits where you engage with the story so um, Event Horizon that I was in which yeah. was a space space horror film. Yeah. The design of the ship it has such an enormous part to play in why that film is still popular 25 years on. Why it, there's something about that cathedral people. You can just you feel it. 
And we felt it walking on the set. You just know something special happened in the design here. You just knew it. Mm. And and Roland has that. I, I remember one day we, on the Patriot, I burned down a church. And I burnt it down. I mean, I burnt it down. You know, wasn't I? <laughs> you ordered it, it? Yeah. And we're standing watching. It was although CGI was around in those days. It was post Jurassic Park, I think. Most things were done for real, and we would shoot at magic hour every day at dawn and at mm. dusk. And they burnt down this church, and there was a purple landscape behind it, and the church was orange. And, you know, it's a huge construction they built there. And yeah. and it finished. And he went, yeah, I think we do it again tomorrow. And I went, what? He goes, yeah, yeah, let's let's do that again tomorrow. And they rebuilt the thing the next day because he just. He knew there was something he could do with the camera or the angles or something. He could do it better. It could be yeah. better, and it was. It was better. Wow, that uh, that's uh, that's crazy. You have to burn it just a whole down. Yeah, <laughs> that's nuts. <laughs> that's nuts. That's nuts. Uh, well, actually, before we move away, very very quickly, um, what what's more historically inaccurate, The Patriot or Braveheart? Oh, they're both phenomenal movies. Don't anybody ever get your history from movies? That's all I would say. <laughs> Unless they're Paul Greengrass yeah. movies. Paul Greengrass. Uh, Paul goes to extreme lengths to make sure things are historically accurate. You can watch Bloody Sunday, you can watch United 93 and know that you're looking at the real soldiers who were there and you were looking at the real air traffic controllers in 1993. But there's nobody else working in the world of fiction who, uh, not who cares, but who wants to make things as accurate as that. Yeah, no, I that I completely agree. Like, uh, what is it? Uh, green, green zone. Green zone is another green one zone. that is just yeah, yeah, brilliant.